Hey YouTube, David here from LiveForever.Try, coming to you early on a Sunday with my morning coffee. And I just wanted to take this like brief quiet moment to film my August wrap up. So August was a decent month for me as far as reading goes. I killed uh, six books total. I honestly thought it was going to be more, uh, but I really can't complain. It was kind of busy with um, work and filming. Um, so as you know, I was doing the 1,000 subscriber special, so that ate up uh, a lot of my time. In addition, a lot of you will be happy to know that we are getting uh, busier at work again, doing some more long-term installations, and uh, have a much more positive outlook on things. So that's a big weight off my shoulders as well. But anyways, so into the book reviews. The first one we're going to be talking about is The Secret of Our Success by Joseph Henrich. And this is one I talked about in my top five books of 2020. Um, so I won't spend too much time on it here, but I'll go over it briefly again. Uh, this was a five-star read for me. Uh, basically, what this book is taking a look at is an anthropological view of history and how culture either influenced our evolution via genetics or our cultural evolution and how it can even transcend that. Um, so on the biological front, it tells us about how we culturally spread the knowledge of how to cook food and how cooking those foods unlocked nutrients that uh, genetically uh, chose for shorter intestines so we could free up energy, possibly to create bigger brains, uh, different things like that. It also talks about culture transcending individual intelligence. Um, so you have like caribou hunters in um, Alaska who would burn the pelvis bone, bone of the um, caribou that they killed to create a map effectively randomizing their hunting locations, which was strictly a successful hunting strategy. Now, none of the practitioners of this religion actually knew that they were randomizing the location, they just knew that it worked. So they had this idea that was created and spread because of culture that drove the success of their people. Next up we have Leave Only Footprints by Connor Knighton. Now this book was a little bit of a surprise for me. I didn't necessarily like seek it out. Um, so what I do a lot of the times is when I'm traveling either to and from work or traveling for business, what I'll do is I'll pull up Overdrive that links to uh, the local library and I'll just sort, sort by audiobooks available now and then nonfiction. And then I'll scan through, see what I can pick up and just listen to it that way. So it's effectively like a little bit of a grab bag for me, but it seems to work out. So Leave Only Footprints here is one that kind of caught me off guard. From the title, I thought it was going to be similar to Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods. And it was similar, but in a different way. Um, so basically what Connor's doing here is he's a freelance writer and filmmaker for CBS. So he's like contractual, like he sells contracts and ideas to them, but he's not an employee of CBS as of the writing of this book. And he opens by saying how his marriage like basically just failed. Like he was engaged and his uh, future wife walked out on him. So he kind of starts the book with that a little bit of heartbreak. And then he works that into his idea of creating this new pitch, something he's always wanted to do. And that's traveling around the United States and visiting every major national park. So he takes us along on this journey with him. He visits the site of the first sunrise in the United States. He talks about the, uh, the Samoas, he talks about Hawaii, he talks about, you know, Zion and the quietest place in America. And, you know, he just goes through all these different parks and combines like a personal memoir-esque like self-discovery journey with uh, tidbits of like uh, scientific fact, you know, what's the geology of this place? You know, how did these formations happen? Uh, what animals are here? Talks about con conservation, so like the mud pups um, and the fish that are in the underground caves. He talks about like the Channel Island foxes and how we bred them basically back into existence. Uh, he talks about condors and that throughout he does um, keep it interesting. So it's not like a bland, dry collection of, you know, just scientific facts. It's uh, all intertwined with the memoir and humor and a little bit of heart pain. So I wasn't expecting to like this book as much as I did, but it kind of came together really well. Um, I ended up rating it four out of five stars. Um, there is parts where it feels a little bit disjointed. Like he tried to put a scientific fact somewhere 
in his memoir and it just kind of like transitioned bad or he put in a little too much sadness in my opinion from like uh, his breakup when I was really interested in a given like conservation of like the condor birds or what have you and then he just kind of caught me off guard. So I did feel a little bit disjointed but overall it was um, a pretty fun read. Then third up we had Conscious by Annika Harris and this was a super short book that I found the same way. So um, on Overdrive connected with a library and this is about 144 pages in hardback if you were to buy it that way. Um, but what it is, is a exploration of consciousness. Um, so basically what this book tries to do is try to give us a good working definition of what consciousness is and then tries to look at what people are thinking about in relations to that topic. Um, so it was a really engaging book and it led to a lot of questions, but I just kind of wish it was longer. Um, so it talks about like, you know, what consciousness is. It says, okay, if we define consciousness as this, you know, do animals have it? Okay, if we define it this other way, does this have it? You know, do we still hold the same consciousness if we do like hallucinogenic drugs? Um, and it talks about a lot of interesting topics within like kind of the philosophy of consciousness, like what it is. It also gets into the weeds a little bit with like panpsychism and like your universal consciousness idea or your emergent property of consciousness, um, which personally I think is super interesting. Um, my only complaint is that while this was a very um, interesting book and while it was engaging, it was just too short for me. I felt like each of the individual chapters could have been its own book and would have been equally interesting and like equally as, you know, hook, line, and sinker pulling me in. Um, but that'd be my only complaint. All in all, it's like, it's a collection of short essays. It's a good four out of five. Good four out of five star read. All right, fourth up, we had Blitzed, Drugs in the Third Reich by Norman Aller. And this was a good book. Um, so basically, if I had to describe it as a more accurate subtitle, it would be Meth, 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 Opiates, Meth, and Nazis, the book. So basically, it starts off by talking about the creation of pervitin or pervitin, which is methamphetamine created just prior to World War II to compete with other drug companies across Europe. And so what ended up happening is he talks about how pervitin uh, started getting into like the Nazi ranks and the generals and whatnot, how it actually led to the success of the Blitzkrieg by being able to out uh, maneuver and just outwork um, I believe it was the French, and if I get that wrong, it's going to be super embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and talks about the, the rampant meth use behind the pilots, the subs, the tanks. And then the other key point of this book is talking about um, the fat doctor, uh, Hitler's personal physician, which was uh, Morel, and how he basically was all about injections. So... It goes through like the personal diaries of like Hitler and Morel's like a uh, physician's book and everything and talks about the hormones, the drugs, the vitamins, just everything Hitler was injected with. Um, so by the end of the war, um, Hitler was getting over 200 injections a year, sometimes multiple times a day, everything ranging from like methamphetamine to like, uh, I believe it was Eucadol, which is like, uh, like a morphine uh, opiate type thing. Um, he also got like, like crushed glands and like bull testicles and hormone injections uh, for vitality injected at him. So it kind of goes into like the mental decline of Hitler towards the end of the war. Um, I will say the book's a little bit start and stop. It doesn't keep a same energy throughout it, but it is kind of a history book. Um, so it's not trying to maintain a pace for a story to a climax or anything. It's more of a historical account. So I can't hold too much against it uh, for that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of super interesting things. If you are really big into World War II, I don't know how much you're going to get from this because I haven't read a lot of World War II. I've only read this relatively short book on it. Um, but personally, as a newcomer to reading about it, the novelty of the subject uh, combined with a little bit of World War II history was super interesting. So if you're like me, I would probably recommend it. Fifth up, we had The Violinist Thumb by Sam Keen, um, subtitled And Other Lost Tales of Love, Genius, and War, as written by our genetic code. 
So I actually picked this book up because I saw it on Olive's channel, who knows how long ago. And currently I'm reading through a bunch of books on genetics. By the way, if you have any good books on epigenetics, I need those because that's what I think I need to round out kind of my entry level list. But regardless. So Sam Keen, I believe, has also wrote this Disappearing Spoon, which is pretty popular. And this is kind of like a collection of short stories that all kind of tie into genetics. So he talks about like um, incestuous relationships and how that leads to the decline of like um, gene, like recessive genes coming out where they're not supposed to. So like the Habsburgs and stuff like that. He talks about the genetic difficulties that even like Darwin might have had and the diseases that he might have had. Um, specifically speaking on the title, The Violinist's Thumb, he talks about a genetic mutation that led to more elastic fingers where you could almost like get your pinky directly out parallel to your hand and that allows the gentleman in question to play violin better. And really it's just a fun collection of mutations and genetic history. It gets into like personal genetic tests and how good um, they can be for you and if they're of any value at all. And all in all, you know, it's a, it's a good sized book coming in at around 350 pages. And the entire time I was, I was pretty hooked on it. So this is a really good book to start out if you're just trying to develop an interest in genetics. So I'd say, you know, start off with something like this because it's going to pique your interest. It's going to give you part of the history. It's going to give you part of the science and it's going to give you a little bit of novelty. And then if you end up taking well to this, you know, go into something like The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee, where it gives you a full in-depth history. And then, you know, past that, you know, jump into Hacking Darwin to see where we can take it in the future. Um, I'll be doing a full video on genetics later, so I'm not going to jump too much more into this. Um, but as far as a book on genetics that is actually legitimately fun to read and not dry and academic, this is a five-star read for that. Then finally, the sixth, books, sixth book that I've read in August, wrapping up the month, is Tetralogue by Timothy Williamson. Uh, you saw me debut this book in my On Philosophy book haul. Um, I'll leave the card up there. But um, this is one of three books I'm starting that is a entry to philosophy. So I have this book, which is um, four people on a train together that are trying to come across the best way to arrive at knowledge or a best way to argue about their ideas, I guess would be a better way of saying it. Um, and then I have two other books, which is like the problems of philosophy and then what questions philosophy tries to answer. Uh, but back to Tetralogue in specific, it's a fairly short book, around 150 pages, 153, um, and it basically is like a Socratic dialogue. So you have these characters introduced, they're on the train together, and you initially have Sarah and then Bob. So Sarah comes from a scientific point of view and ends up later identifying as a phallibist. And Bob is kind of your layperson. He believes in witchcraft, and that's kind of what the initial argument is um, going on about. Then you have a character named um, Zach that jumps in, and Zach is a relativist, so he tries to like reconcile the uh, two views and ends up failing. Bob and Sarah both kind of turn on him. And then finally, in the second half of the book, you have a character called Roxana that comes in, and she has like studied uh, logic. Uh, so specifically, I believe it was Aristotelian, Aristotelian, the the logic of Aristotle. <laughs> and so she jumps in and basically gives them all hell. And each character is pretty well developed, so they have like their own little personalities and everything. You end up figuring out who you do and don't like. And along the way, it does end up giving you these four kind of. I guess, schools of thought, you know, relativism, fallibism, um, logic, and then whatever the hell Bob is. Um, but yeah, it was, it's a good introductory read to uh, philosophy. I would say if you've ever taken a philosophy course, this is going to fall flat for you. But if you are just like somebody that is reading for the very first time, it's probably worth it, especially with how short it is. But yeah, that's all I got for you so far. So six books for August puts me to a hit of my book a week goal. So I have no complaints there. And I do have a lot of good books sitting on my TBR for September. 
Um, so hopefully that's going to be another successful month as well. It's going to be interesting. Last September is when I fell flat on my goal and did not read at all. This year with COVID happening and the lack of business, um, we're still about at 40% capacity. So, but we're doing a lot of planning for like future events and whatnot. Um, just the nature of how things are going. We have fewer events, but each of them take more energy with, you know, COVID happening. Um, but it's going to be interesting to make sure I'm reading the same amount and see how much I actually get done. Because I have a big drive for reading right now, a big drive to create more videos, and that's pushing me to read more. Um, but at the same time, work's getting busier, so that's pushing me not to. Um, I think reading's going to come out ahead in this um, aspect. But yeah, I'm just trying to stay optimistic about it and not put too much on my plate at one time. Um, but yeah, so you can definitely follow along by liking, commenting, and subscribing. As you know, it always helps the channel, helps the growth, and helps me along the algorithm. Um, if you have any books you'd like to see me read in the future or topics you'd like me to cover, drop those below as well. All right, until next time, see ya.